a soft midsummer night, we stood upon the roof of the United States Observatory. Above us, the fathomless heavens, the waning moon and silent stars. Professor Harkness moved an axle. The great revolving dome turned round and parted. The great telescope was pointed to the opening and the broad seam of sky visible between. There were the mountains in the moon, their jagged edges, their yawning craters. Those were the vivid memories of journalist writer Mary Clemmer Ames as she peered through a telescope on these grounds back in 1872. Just yards away, workers were building a dome to house the 26-inch telescope, soon to be the largest in the world. Many firsts in science took place in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. This is where the science of oceanography was born, where the moons of Mars were discovered, where the underwater path of the first transatlantic cable was plotted. This location played a key role in the Civil War, our westward expansion, and in the development of military medicine. Welcome to one of the most fascinating locations in our nation. In the 1820s, President John Quincy Adams recognized that powerful nations and science were synonymous. And the prestige science of that time was astronomy. The British had their National Observatory at Greenwich. The French had theirs in Paris. And before long, even the Tsar of Russia, the ruler of a, a poverty-stricken nation, would have his observatory at St. Petersburg. And so John Quincy Adams asked the Congress to appropriate funds to build a national observatory for the United States in Washington, D.C. An observatory which he called a lighthouse of the sky. But it didn't happen during Adams' presidency. Few legislators could see the practicality of having a core of elite scientists studying the craters of the moon, the rings of Saturn, or looking for undiscovered asteroids. Still, there was a practical reason for having an observatory. Because this was still the age of sail and celestial navigation, steering by the stars was essential. This meant certain instruments were required, a chronometer to determine longitude, and a sextant to measure an angle between the horizon and a celestial body such as the sun, moon, star, or planet. Once that angle was determined, you referred to a table in the nautical almanac, which revealed your latitude. Of course, in modern times, we have our global positioning system, our GPS, but in the old days, in the age of sail, you navigated by the stars. And in order to do that kind of navigation, you had to have a place where you could determine the positions of the stars in relation to the Earth. It was for this purpose that the Naval Observatory was finally built in 1844. The observatory's 9.6-inch refracting telescope once occupied this room. Mounted on a shelf above, were six solid-shot, 32-pound cannonballs acting as ball bearings. The dome actually rolled around on the cannonballs. Five trap doors or hatches raised by rope and pulley opened in sequence, providing access to the night sky for the 9.6-inch German refracting telescope made by Mertz and Mollet. A wind-up clock motor actuated by weights enable the telescope to track an object across the sky. By the close of the Civil War, the observatory entered its golden age. As an internationally recognized institution, the observatory dispatched its scientists to Europe, Siberia, and remote locations around the world to observe solar eclipses. To record the transit of Venus across the face of the sun in 1874, eight well-trained teams fanned out across the far Pacific. Never a top-of-the-line instrument, the 9.6-inch refractor was still the workhorse of the observatory. However, after 30 years of use, scientists were unable to observe many objects that were routinely being seen by astronomers who had larger instruments. 
So in 1871, Congress passed a bill that included $40,000 in gold for the acquisition of what was to be the world's largest telescope. The lens would be 26 inches in diameter and the tube almost 33 feet in length. To build the instrument, the Navy commissioned the finest opticians in the world, Alvin Clark and Sons of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Modern technology had indeed come to this side of the Atlantic. What had once been the dream of John Quincy Adams was now reality. The United States had not only achieved scientific independence, but now was technologically superior to Europe in many ways. Because of its size, the new telescope called the Great Equatorial would not fit on the third floor where the 9.6 inch refractor resided. A new rotunda had to be constructed. It was completed in 1873 and the new telescope affixed to a huge cast iron mount was then dedicated by President Ulysses S. Grant. Four years later, Mars and Earth were as close to one another as they had been for many years and the telescope was in the hands of one of the observatory's most skilled astronomers, Asaph Hall. Asaph Hall was on duty. It was a hot, humid August night in 1877. He was looking through the eyepiece of this gigantic telescope, the biggest in the world at the time. He had it pointed just a little bit east of south. He looked through the eyepiece and he saw what looked to him like a bright object, very, very close to the surface of Mars. Upon closer examination, he realized it was a satellite, it was a moon, and he named it Phobos. A few nights later, when the foggy bottom night cleared sufficiently, he discovered the second of the Martian moons, which he named Deimos. But with those two moons of Mars, the mass of Mars could be determined for the first time by Kepler's laws, and so that was the scientific significance. But it was important also for American astronomy because it really put the Naval Observatory on the map. Uh, these discoveries were announced around the world and uh, really made the Naval Observatory a first-class institution. There was no doubt that the U.S. Naval Observatory was now the finest observatory in the world. The first superintendent of the Naval Observatory was Matthew Fontaine Morey, whose accomplishments during his tenure earned him the nickname Pathfinder of the Seas. But before Morey, a young naval officer James Gillis was given the duty of building the observatory and envisioned himself as being named the observatory's first superintendent. Gillis was certainly the logical choice to become the first superintendent of the Naval Observatory. He had secured the appropriation, uh, he had designed the building and secured the instruments, uh, but in the end he was not named uh, the first superintendent because of politics mainly. The Secretary of the Navy at the time was John Y. Mason who was Virginian and decided to appoint his fellow Virginian, uh, Matthew Fontaine Maury, to be the first superintendent of the observatory. His selection as superintendent of the observatory seemed an odd choice to many. Well, Maury was not formally educated. He didn't go to the higher universities such as Harvard or Yale to, to study science. He was really a self-taught man. He was a man who lived within his time as he was a very devoted family man and a very religious man, but he was a man who lived ahead of his time. Someone that we would say today is a thinker outside the box. Ironically, Matthew Morey's passion was not astronomy. It was the science of the oceans. And in fact, he's what's called the father of modern oceanography. Morey was interested in all the things we associate with modern oceanography today. Winds and currents, tides, marine meteorology, the depth and composition of the ocean bottom, the salinity of seawater, even the feeding habits of marine mammals. He even took his work home with him in the East Wing where he wrote his magnum opus, The Physical Geography of the Sea, considered to be the first textbook for this new science of oceanography. And this book really won him fame and acclaim, not only here in the United States, but overseas in Europe and around the world. What really made the book unique was in the back section where he had foldouts. He actually had depths of the Atlantic Ocean. You think of that, it's one thing to know the depth along the coast, but to know the depth in the middle of the ocean and along the path of the ocean was, was really quite unique. In addition to his landmark textbook, 
Maury revolutionized travel on the seas by his introduction of wind and current charts. Prior to Maury's charts, a sea voyage's success was determined by guests and by God. But by 1850, with the California gold rush in full swing, adventurers were looking for the fastest way to get to the gold fields. Clipper ships, sleek greyhounds of the sea, had just been brought to their highest level of speed and efficiency in American yards. Clipper ships were the fastest ships of the time, the fastest ships ever to sail under canvas. In fact, they were so fast, you could have water skied behind them. Using Maury's wind and current charts, a clipper captain sailing from Boston or New York could reach San Francisco often in fewer than 100 days, a voyage that used to take over 130 days. The Flying Cloud did it in 89 days using Maury's charts. Then, as now, time was money, and Maury's accomplishments were lionized in the seafaring community here and abroad. In the early 1850s, congressmen asked themselves why we recognize Greenwich in Great Britain as having the prime meridian. So they proposed legislation to create the prime meridian of the United States to be in Washington and to be designated to run through the center of the Naval Observatory's dome. When word leaked out about the proposed bill, the seafaring community was not amused. Changing the prime meridian's location would mean that all their navigational charts, which used Greenwich, would become obsolete. Charts at that time were a considerable investment for a ship's owner or the Navy itself. As a result, the legislation died and Greenwich continued its role as the prime meridian for navigation. For the determination of longitude in the United States, however, the center of the observatory's dome would be recognized as zero degrees. Since territories in the West were coming into the Union as states both during and after the Civil War, the boundaries of those states had to be determined. The center of the observatory's dome thus became the reference for laying out the boundaries of those states. For example, the eastern boundary of Colorado, which is the western boundary of Kansas, is a meridian of longitude measured from the center of the observatory's dome. The science Maury pursued at the observatory had other far-reaching significance. Cyrus Field, also a visionary, had in mind was to connect Europe and the United States. And he wanted to build a transatlantic cable on the bottom of the seafloor. He came to the observatory to confer with Matthew Maury, who agreed, using soundings that the Navy had taken over the years, to lay out an under-ocean profile between Newfoundland and Ireland, a shallow portion of the North Atlantic where it would be feasible to lay a cable. It was connected and the Queen of England and President Buchanan uh, transmitted uh, messages to each other. Cyrus said, while I supplied the work and while England supplied the money, it was Maury who supplied the brains. But the Civil War brought an abrupt end to Matthew Maury's career as a world-renowned scientist. For anyone who had to decide whether to remain loyal to the Union or go with the Confederacy, it was a wrenching decision. With Maury, it was, it was a terrible decision. He had the ideal job. He got to do his science. He had no supervision. He did whatever he wanted. He lived on the premises. He was internationally renowned by this time, but he's a Virginian. And uh, in those days, if you were from the South, your state was almost your country. The federal government in Washington was less significant than your state. So he made that fateful choice, and Maury then picked up the pen and he wrote uh, his resignation letter to President Abraham Lincoln. I believe once he jumped ship, so to speak, uh, his mark in, in American history, in American science, uh, got pushed to the, pushed to the bottom. Uh, in fact, when he um, left the, the Union, on May 4th, the Boston Herald Traveler, which was the newspaper at the time in Boston, uh, had an uh, ad in there of a $5,000 reward for Jefferson Davis, uh, $3,000 for General Beauregard, and $3,000 for the traitor, Lieutenant Matthew Maury. 
The buildings that comprise the old Naval Observatory served as more than incubators of innovation. They played an important role in our history too, with a memorable chapter during the Civil War, the era of brother against brother. In the years before the Civil War, the Naval Observatory was a training ground for young officers who were just graduating from the Naval Academy in Annapolis. They would come here, they would learn celestial navigation because these were gonna be the officers who were gonna command ships in the U.S. Navy. Little did anyone know that they would command ships in two navies, the Union and Confederate navies. Prior to the Civil War, we had two officers who worked here, uh, a man named uh, John Brooke, a Floridian, and a man named John Warden from New York State. In 1861, they went their separate ways. John Brooke joined the Confederacy, and his most famous job in the Confederate Navy was to raise the USS Merrimack from where it had been burned uh, at the Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk, and his job was to raise it and convert it to an ironclad, renamed the CSS Virginia, but always known under its original name, the Merrimack. John Warden from New York remained loyal to the Union. His most famous job in the Union Navy was commander of the USS Monitor. Brooke and Warden became not only enemies, but synonymous with one of the most epic naval battles of all time, the battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack marking the demise of wooden warships. While the war raged on, and with the Confederacy just across the Potomac River in Virginia, the astronomers nevertheless maintained their work schedule. Asaph Hall was a man who would rather look through the eyepiece of a telescope than eat. When Hall had the duty, he hated the arrival of unexpected visitors. He would close the trapdoor on the observation level, and then he would drag the big heavy observing ladder over the opening. And then, if you arrived unannounced, you could knock until your knuckles were bleeding. He was not going to answer. One night, he was at his post upstairs observing the night sky. Soon enough, he heard someone ascending the ladder. It is likely he began rolling his eyes, knowing what was about to begin. And sure enough, knocking. Unlike others who usually gave up after several minutes, this visitor continued to knock. The noise grew louder and more persistent. Hall had had enough. In a fit of rage, he moved the observation ladder and he reached down and he pulled up on the trapdoor and much to his shock, up through the opening in the floor, came the stovepipe hat of Abraham Lincoln. Perhaps the unhappiest man on the planet at that time was President Abraham Lincoln. The war was going badly. Seven weeks or so earlier, the Battle of Gettysburg had been fought, and it was a great Union victory. However, General Meade, the victor of that battle, failed to pursue the Confederates in their defeat, and so the war would drag on. His wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, was teetering on the edge of, of depression or perhaps even insanity. They lost their son, Willie, about a year earlier. The family was still in mourning, uh, and there was no relief at home because the president lived where he worked. And so to gain relief from the stress of his office, he would often wander the city. On this particular night, he came to the observatory. doesn't mean they didn't observe on other nights, but they were what they call partial nights. You might get an hour here, an hour there, 
before the foggy bottom clouds came in and made observations impossible. As a result, the Navy decided to move the observatory in 1893 to where it still resides today on Georgetown Heights. To no one's surprise, the observing conditions improved considerably, so much so that the great equatorial is still in use. Its superb 26-inch lens, shaped without benefit of computer or laser, is thought to be the oldest scientific instrument in continuous use. The hilltop at Foggy Bottom represents a significant historical data point for the United States Navy and for the Navy Medical Department. The Navy turned the property over to the Navy Medical Department, which moved the Naval Museum of Hygiene to this location, which featured a sizable assortment of medical instruments and nautical artifacts, many collected by Navy surgeons on their journeys around the world. Then, in 1902, the Naval Medical School moved in, and with it, the tradition of science and discovery continued. But now, microscopes replace the telescope. Here, newly commissioned physicians learn not only to be naval officers, but also what they wouldn't find in a civilian medical school, the treatment of ballistic wounds and burns, tropical medicine, and the kind of medicine they would practice as Navy physicians serving in worldwide naval hospitals, on the battlefield with the Marine Corps, or with the fleet. Between 1906 and 1910, new buildings sprang up when the Washington Naval Hospital moved to the compound. There was an attempt to actually bring together all aspects of Navy medicine under one location and to make sure that the administration and the clinical parts of Navy medicine were all brought together. In a sense, it was the first attempt to actually get to patient-centered care. All of Navy medicine, from the clinical the corpsman and the nursing aspects were housed here at Foggy Bottom, as well as dentistry. And then came World War I, which provided a test bed for two of the latest technologies, the airplane and the submarine. Two new wings were built to accommodate uh, these new disciplines, a school of aviation medicine and a school of undersea medicine. Later, the Naval Hospital became the Naval Medical Center, where it operated at the Foggy Bottom site until 1942, when all medical treatment moved to the brand new National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Today, the campus is the home of the Navy Medical Department's administrative headquarters. Known as the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, this department directs the management of the Navy's medical mission. That includes the recruitment, training, and assignment of physicians dentists, nurses, medical service corps officers, and hospital corpsmen. The Bureau of Medicine and Surgery represents Navy Medicine's hub, the center of a wheel whose spokes reach worldwide, not only providing health care to Navy and Marine Corps personnel and their dependents, but offering humanity.